Welcome to the virtual dimension of the teaching ministry here at Living Springs. And uh, today we bring you the teaching from last Sunday. That would be Resurrection Sunday here at Living Springs. And um, so if you would, we're going to open this morning to kind of set the stage for this teaching on the resurrection entitled, Have Joy Will Finish. Well, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 to open with this morning, where we are admonished as believers, as those who identify with Christ in his atoning death as well as his, his victorious resurrection. We're told it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author of and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and you know a pastor that I learned a lot from a guy named Chuck Smith used to say and I've heard it in other places and I think it's true it doesn't matter so much how you start out but how you finish in the NCAA basketball tournament that is currently unfolding here, it's the season that that happens, you know, it means nothing really to be seated in, high up in a particular bracket. If that team that enters the tournament seated like number one and number two in their bracket, I mean, it's a big deal, I guess, but if they don't get through the bracket and into the final four, well, who cares how they were seated? Myself, I've, um, I've always rooted for the University of Arizona. I've always been excited when their teams would get in, basketball team would make it into the tournament, follow them. But I have to tell you that I can remember twice, possibly three times, when they were seated number one in their bracket, and in the very first game, they were knocked out by the lowest seated team in the bracket. And so, yeah, it's kind of disappointing, but you know, honestly, that's just a game. That's all it is, it's just a game. But what about the race that we've been saved in Christ to live and the destiny that awaits us across the finish line? You know, you hear about all the hoopla, these big name celebrities, who people make a big deal about, you know, wow, he came to Jesus. And, and then they fizzle out and they fall away in only a few years time. I've seen it happen so often. And, you know, I think about you and I. What about us who may not be big name celebrities, but will we finish the course? You know, passing through this present life in this present world in these temporal earthly bodies, face it confronts all of us with challenges, trials, issues, limitations, <laughs> lies, temptations that weigh us down with the likes of sorrow and disappointment, jealousy, resentment, anger, suffering, anxiety, and doubt. Only to just name but a few, I think I've only scratched the surface, easily entrapping us in the deadly snare of sin, which I think drives home the serious relevance of this verse that we just read from Hebrews chapter 2, that encourages all who truly identify by faith with Jesus Christ to run the race, finish the course. And that's going to require that it is done with endurance, okay? In other words, staying the course, faithfully pressing onward and that's what it's like sometimes it's like you just all you can do to press on toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus and doing so relatively unrestrained now not and I say relatively because sin is an issue the flesh is always an issue that we have to deal with in our lives we do stumble we do fall but when I say unrestrained it means it doesn't stop us and we're told that it depends on two things here in this verse. It says, 
it, it depends on, number one, the one that we're focused on following and learning from so as to pursue and realize, number two, the same objective or reward that he lived for and realized. And we're talking about Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Coming to faith in Jesus Christ is great, you know, but um, it doesn't mean anything if you don't finish. If you don't cross the finish line in the faith. You see, who you focus on following and learning from so as to pursue what it is that he pursued and realized, that would be Jesus. Well, the two go hand in hand. I mean, really. Staying focused on following and learning from Jesus will in the end ensure that you and I reach the same objective that he lived for and realized. And what was that? <laughs> well, I mean, really, how did Jesus do it? because the two of them are linked. It's not really complicated, okay? Notice that we're told, it says, who for the joy. I'm gonna say that again, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured. He had his eyes on the prize, if you will. The joy that was set before Jesus. Now, you see when something is set before you, you don't have it yet, but you see it, and it's there, and you want it. Because, well, hey, here's the deal. You're the one who has to choose whether you want it or not. And the value that you place on that which has been set before you, Jesus likened unto a pearl of great price, for which... The one who bought pearls was, well, like he sold everything in order to obtain that. Well, that's what the kingdom of, of God is and what heaven is all about. So yeah, the, the value that you place on that which is set before you, here it is, is going to determine what, if anything, you're going to be willing to endure in the pursuit of realizing it. It really is, it's a value judgment. If you don't place much value on it, certain, uh, when sacrifice is required, the degree of that sacrifice or the pain or whatever it is you're going to have to deal with in the pursuit of that, and you determine that, oh man, it, it's not worth it. That happens a lot of time to people who come to faith in Jesus Christ and confronted with the issues of this present life and the issues associated with these frail, weak, corruptible, temporal bodies. And when I say temporal, I mean they're temporary. They're temporary like, well, living in a tent. Honestly, uh, I remember myself, well, I was homeless for a point, my life and time, and I lived in a tent for months. But I remember one time a windstorm came up and just, man, it, it took my tent and just, man, it tore it up big time. And that's what oftentimes the winds of, the contrary winds of suffering and um, challenges and trials in this life are the same thing. They, they can take these bodies and this temporary life and it just tear it all up and leaving you, you know, just like broken. So, yeah, these bodies are just temporary. And as we pass through this world in these bodies, we do have to deal with some issues and things that come up, which, you know, you're going to have to be willing to endure these things in the pursuit of realizing what it is that God has set before you. That is, again, if you really want it. Which, you know, in the case of Jesus, we're told was a joy. It, it was a joy for which we're told he endured the cross. That's right. Despising the shame. I mean, the cross, the crucifixion of Christ, his arrest, his trial, his, he was made a public mockery. They just 
so much shame and hum humiliation was attached to that in addition to the physical and the emotional suffering that he endured. It was excruciating beyond what anyone, you and I will ever face in this life. But it was for that joy that was set before him, we're told that Jesus endured that and has now, he's, he's reached it. He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what was the joy for which Jesus was gladly willing to endure the shame and the suffering of the cross? Well, you know, having that joy, it says, had been set before him, and it had been set before him for, from everlasting to everlasting, so that Jesus saw it all along. He told his followers, for example, in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, that the Son of Man, and he identified himself when he first came as, well, yeah, being clothed in humility of an earthly body like the rest of us. It says, then as such, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and now... See, that's what he had to endure. But now comes the joy. He said, and be raised the third day. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said to his followers, he said, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. I was thinking, you know, we look back on the resurrection and it should be a great cause for joy in the fact that Jesus was resurrected. But, um, you know, his followers at the time, they didn't get it. Okay, they, they were sorrowful about what they heard Jesus say because they only heard part of it, really. I mean, being betrayed and being killed. Hey, his followers fully understood that. We've all seen it. And yes, being betrayed, yeah, we've probably even encountered that in the course of our own lives. But the resurrection, I mean, at that point, such a concept was beyond their own limited experience and understanding. I mean, nobody they knew had heard of had ever encountered a resurrection from the dead. The thing is, however, Jesus saw it on account of the fact that joy had been set before him as the end from eternally beyond the beginning of time. As, you know, he explained to his disciples in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 33. He's, then he took the twelve aside and said to them, we read, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. Jesus, we're told in the book of Revelation, is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, his appointed redemptive mission on the cross had always been eternally predetermined. And um, Jesus is informing his followers that now it's going to happen. So, it had always been scripted in the redemptive plan of God. Jesus went on to say, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles. That would be the Romans. He would be brought before Pilate and, and judged and condemned by Pilate. And will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him. Scourging was a procedure, a very cruel one, that they actually inflicted upon the victims of those who were slated to be crucified before they ever made it to the cross. It was so horrific that probably nine out of ten died on the stump as a result of being scourged. And as a result, the Romans didn't have to go through the trouble of, per of crucifying them. So they would scourge him, and then that wouldn't kill him. Not Jesus, because Jesus would suffer to the complete max, okay? Drink to the dregs the cup of the suffering that had been handed to him, that had been foreordained from the foundations of the world and beyond. But it says in the third day, Jesus said, he will rise again. 
See, the point being, Jesus knew it was going to happen. He knew the resurrection was going to happen. It was a certainty. And so that was the joy that, that he kept always and ever before him. It's like he could see through all of the trials, the challenges, the tribulations, the persecution, the suffering, and even, even the agony and incredible torture of what he was going to endure being scourged and then crucified. Because there it was, he saw the resurrection. And so it did. Yeah, it happened. It happened. He was resurrected, which explains the significance of what it is that, you know, we're into celebrating as those who identify with Jesus Christ this time every year. So let's get into our text in your Bibles now. And this is what we want you to open up to. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, our, our first passage as we take a look at the Word of God. We read here, it says, Now the Sabbath, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. And behold, let me see, his countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as the snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So there were guards there. The tomb had been sealed with a large stone that was humanly immovable unless, you know, he had quite a few people to do it. And to protect that from happening, the, there were guards there as Jesus' body had been interred inside. And the guards shook for fear of him because there was this great, this angel whose clothing was white as snow. And they became like dead men, but the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples the word. Now, the temporal earthly body that Jesus had first come into this world in, and he was born there, we celebrate that at Christmas, the angel tells them, you've come to see, to, you've come here, to the tomb and you realize here's this angel and he tells the women he's not there. That body, that dead temporal earthly body wasn't there. Something had happened. I mean quite literally changed. I mean how so? Well you know the angel rolled back the huge stone that sealed the tomb revealing that Jesus temporal earthly body had literally disappeared. As Jesus was now clothed in a glorious, incorruptible, and heavenly body that, you know, was no longer bound by the limitations of Jesus', Jesus previous earthly body. As a result, well, Jesus wasn't there. Jesus could now be anywhere at any time. Not even the stone walls of the tomb could restrain or constrain his resurrection body. He just left. I can't say he walked through the walls, but we'll kind of get an idea about what he was able to do as we go on. Anyway, check it out. Matthew chapter 28, verses 7 through 10. Okay, we've already done this. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. It says, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet, worshipped him, and Jesus told them, don't be afraid, but go tell my brethren to go on to Galilee, and there they will meet me. And it takes us back to something we read last Friday at our communion gathering where Jesus informed his disciples following their Passover meal prior to his arrest in the garden. In Matthew 26, verses 31 and 32, he, he told them at that time, he said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, 
God already foretold this was going to happen. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But he said, after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. He'd already told them. Still, however, you know, uh, the, the reality of Jesus' physical resurrection was still way beyond the ability of Jesus' followers to process at this point. See what I mean? Well, let's go over to John chapter 20, verses 2 through 10. We read, it says, Then she ran, came to Simon Peter, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John, he referred to himself frequently as the disciple whom Jesus loved. I, you know, he wrote this particular epistle, and I'm really, I'm not epistle, but gospel, and he, in referring to himself as such, you can tell that's what he wanted to be known as. I think what a wonderful thing to be known as. Not our names, not who we are, what we've accomplished, what we've done, not the titles that we possess or the accomplishments that we've done, but the fact that we're loved by Jesus. It's got to be the most important thing there is about us. And that really is our testimony. And so this was John's as well. He referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Anyway, we'll go on. And said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. So in spite of what the angel had told them, they're still, you know, like, it, it, it doesn't square with human experience at all. It's like, there's just this internal dissonance within them of what Jesus said would happen that they, they didn't get what the angel revealed to them. But they're like, but he's not here. The, the resurrection is something that still they didn't understand what it, what it is. And I find we don't understand, many of us, even as Christians. Like the song that we were singing here a little earlier, here in Sunday morning, I should say, uh, where it talked about, it said, the body that was dead began to breathe. Well, that's called resuscitation. <laughs> That's not resurrection, and I can tell you that because it's the same old body. It's the same old earthly, corruptible, temporal body. And that's the whole point of the resurrection, as I said earlier. There's a change. Something changed. Okay. So anyway, we'll get an idea now about the kind of different body Jesus was now clothed in and maybe help us understand the very nature of the resurrection. So let's cruise on down. Let's keep going here. <clears throat> so they ran together. The other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. And Simon Peter came, following him, and just blew right by him. It says here, went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. But no, no body. <laughs> then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went and also he saw and he believed. But what did he believe? He believed that, yeah, what the woman told him. They came and took him. The body's not here. He's yet to believe in the resurrection because he hasn't seen it, but he's about to. Anyway, because it says in verse 9, for as yet they didn't know the scripture. They didn't understand what the scripture was saying when it says that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So, yeah, what to make of it? They don't go to Galilee. That's the last thing on their mind. It's just, they're confused at this point, and they, they go home. It's like, it's one of these things I would ask you if you were in their shoes, what would you have done? So, you know, let's not get too hard down on these guys, okay? Let's continue here, because like I said, they're going to see very shortly. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she went, she stooped down, looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. 
And then he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've laid him. So again, they, they, she doesn't get it yet, but that won't be much longer. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And she didn't know that it was Jesus. Remember I said, something had changed. And now you begin, I hope, to get the picture that the resurrection body of Jesus wasn't the same body that he was buried in. She doesn't know that it's him. She doesn't recognize him. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. She wanted to care for the body of her beloved Savior, her Lord Jesus. And, you know, this must have touched the Lord because Jesus said to her, look what he said. He said, he said, Mary. Now, I just said it that way because, you know, there it is, Mary. It'd be easy to look at and go, yeah, Mary, Mary. No, I think that what happened was is the way he said it. I mean, he would have been so touched by her being there, her tears, her sorrow, her great love for him. He said, he, it just, how could he restrain himself? Jesus said, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, that is to say teacher. She understood who he is by the way he responded to her. It was the love in his voice that she had grown so familiar with. It was the love that had attracted her. It was the love that had drawn her after him. It was the love that had her there weeping in sorrow at the thought that someone had taken his body. And that love, she knew then, it was Jesus. So Jesus said to her, verse 17, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. In other words, you can't hold me back. And that's the thing I find in death. The people we love, it's so hard to let go of them. You know, we wish we could sometimes hold them back. I remember when my mother passed away. You know, she was 91, and she was a believer in Christ, and she was ready to meet her Lord, had been looking forward to it for quite some time. And um, I was talking with her on the phone because she's in California, and they just took her to the emergency room and 10.30 in the morning, and she had, had gone home to Jesus by 5 o'clock that evening. And I was talking to her on the phone at, during that time. And I remember, you know, assuring her. It's like I knew how much she wanted to be with the Lord, and it was her time. And I told her, as much as it pained me, I said, you know, I'm not going to hold you back. There's nothing. I'm not going to say things that are going to break your heart. I'm not going to... You know, th this is a wonderful time for you. This is, you're, you're going to cross the finish line into that joy that God has set before you, you know, and I'm not going to hold you back. And so Jesus was, you know, telling them, you know, you, don't hold me back. You can't. But do this. He said, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. What a beautiful picture. So yeah, notice again, I just have to repeat this, the fact that when she first sees him, she doesn't recognize him, but she does recognize the love in his voice, and that awakens. She knows for sure who this is. But the body has changed completely. It's not the same body that was buried. And now here comes even further evidence of the kind of physical body Jesus was resurrected in. Check this out. Look down here at verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, so this is the same day that Jesus was raised, and all that stuff was happening at the tomb. It says, When the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So they are hiding away in a room in Jerusalem. The door is shut and it's boarded. Because they're terrified 
that, you know, they're next on the docket to be rounded up and, and to see the same thing happen to Jesus, I mean, happen to them that happened to Jesus. Seeing only and understanding only the business of being betrayed, suffering, and dying. So, we see that. <laughs> and now, look, look what happens. There they are. They're, they're terrified. They don't know what to do next. And then it says, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. He was, suddenly there he was just standing there in their midst. In spite of the fact that the door was shut, it was barred. Nobody came knocking on it. It wasn't like the Lord knocked on the door and said, hey, dudes, hey, it's Jesus, let me in. They're freaking out, they're terrified, and then, Next thing they see, Jesus is standing there in their midst. And, and he says, peace be with you. Man, don't you love that, man? When God, when the Lord just brings peace into the middle of your, your nightmare. And uh, that was what the resurrection brought to them, finally. Okay? Because there he is. He's standing in their midst. So, you know, beholding their obvious state of shock and fear, he says to them, you know, peace be with you. And probably something that they'd heard him say before. But again, there's that love. There's what the Lord brings in this intimate relationship. That he calls his followers to enjoin with him. And I love that when I hear the, the voice of the Lord by the spirit that is in me speak those words to me in some of my darkest hours. And that's what it's like when you draw close to the Lord, okay? And then in order to erase any confusion about who he is, let's look at verses 20 through 26, okay? When he'd said this, he showed them his hands, his side, and his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins, they are retained. Now John, or Thomas, called the twin of the twelve, wasn't with him when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. So he said to them, again, they, he hasn't seen the resurrection. He doesn't know anything about what this is. I mean, this is beyond him. And he says the only thing I think that is humanly reasonable. I would expect this from anybody. He tells them, unless I see his hands and the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, we need to, again, remember the fact that the body that Jesus was raised in was not the same body that was buried. However... God has made it a point that forever, however, he will bear the he holes in his hands and the marks of his crucifixion as the evidence and the testimony of his love for us. It will always be there. It's much the same as, well, like a wedding ring that you wear. Husband and a wife give those to each other at the time they're joined together. And every time you look at that ring, it's there to testify of the love of your spouse or at least it's supposed to. And um, here Jesus has these marks they will forever bear as testimony to the love that he has for us. But anyway, everything else is, it's a completely different body. And it, it, that, that comes home again here, because check it out, verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. They were in that room. The door was shut. It says that, the doors were shut. And then Jesus appears again. There he is. He stands in the midst of them and he says, peace to you. So it doesn't matter where Jesus is. He can be anywhere at any time and nothing can stop him. He can just disappear and, and then he appears someplace else in a physical resurrection body. So then he says to Thomas, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here, put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. 
And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now listen to what Jesus says now because he's speaking to you and I. Jesus said to Thomas, Okay, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But here's the word for you and I today. Here it is. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Why is it? What's he talking about? Jesus is talking about the fact that the resurrection has now been set before us. We have this wonderful testimony of so many. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. We have it here in the Word of God, the testimony of the true Word of God. And then there's another example. John 21, verses 1 through 13 says, After these things, Jesus showed him again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And here's how he showed himself. Again. Now, Simon Peter... Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and the two others of his disciples were together there at the Sea of Galilee. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, well, we'll go along with you. Let's do this. So they went out and immediately got into the boat that night and they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet, here we go again, the disciples did not know it was Jesus. I'm like, this is incredible. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, okay, hey, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now, you know, they've been out there all night fishing and not, hadn't caught anything. So, like, you know, what have we got to lose? So they cast, and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, again, this is John, said to Peter, <laughs> I can see him now. He's like, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they weren't far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. I mean, Peter, man, he's, he's going to swim to shore to meet Jesus. But as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish that were already on it. I mean, it, it's a miracle. There, there's... They caught all this fish, and yet they get there, and Jesus already has the fish on the, on the grill. Jesus said, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net wasn't broken. So Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared now to ask, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Isn't that amazing? From now on, it's like, uh, we're not going to ask anymore who you are. Why? They've seen the resurrection. So th that's the amazing thing about that. Jesus appears on the shore, and you know the defining thing about the resurrection is, is that now I think you see from the testimony of Scripture that th in the resurrection there is a total, radically, it, and complete change. The fact that through death, Jesus basically got to change from one body into a new body. That weak, corruptible, earthly body was so limited, confined by its very nature, disappeared. And Jesus inherited in his place in the resurrection. Now, this is what the resurrection is. A totally whole new, eternally incorruptible, absolutely and eternally perfect, heavenly, physical body. A physical body that isn't bound by the limitations of these earthly temporary bodies that you and I now inhabit. I mean, Jesus can be in one place, and then we know that in this, the narrative where he met two disciples on the road to Emmaus, 
He walked along with them. They didn't know it was Jesus. And when he started to talk about the resurrection, about the fact that he would be raised, it was spoken by the prophets that it would happen. And this was after his crucifixion and his death, you know. And <clears throat> suddenly he disappears. He just disappears. And they're like, oh, who is that? And then they remembered the words that he spoke to them about the resurrection and something inside of them told them, wow, that was the Lord. <laughs> so, you know, it is. So what exactly does this mean for you and I, okay? Think about Jesus then and the fact that, you know, in this first chapter of Acts, he literally physically, before their very eyes, ascends. And then disappears out of sight behind the clouds. Well, I'll tell you what. When it comes to you and I, try this. <clears throat> when you get home today, go stand in front of a mirror. Just do it. Just stand in front of the mirror. Just look at yourself. And consider this, okay? John, sorry, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Listen to this. In fact, mark this in your Bible. When you go home, stand in front of the mirror and you look at yourself. I want you to take your Bible and read this to yourself and consider. <laughs> it says, look, beloved, now we are children of God. That's the thing about being in Christ. Okay, We are now the children of God. Born of the Spirit by... Uh, unto God in Jesus Christ, we know that. We have that assurance of his spirit within us. But it says, and yet it has not been revealed what we shall be. What does that mean? It means that these earthly, temporal, weak, frail, and corruptible bodies that we currently inhabit are not going to be the ones we have to live in forever. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what, you, when you're young and, you, you know, you're strong and vibrant and beautiful and stuff, you know, <laughs> yeah, that might be kind of hard to get a hold of, but, well, you know, you get older like me, you start to realize, yeah, you know, I, <laughs> this body doesn't do what it used to do. It doesn't look as good as it used to look, whatever, you know, it's just you realize this fact. So I'm glad that one day I'm going to shake this thing and I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to leave it. And I'm going to get something so much better. So it does. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God and yet it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. And this is the message of the resurrection. This is what it's all about because it says now that it's been set before us in the person of Jesus Christ says, but we know, John's telling us this, man. He says, but we know that when he is revealed, that is when we see him face to face one day, we shall be like him. Wow. We shall be just like him, for we shall see him as he is. You look at Jesus, you'll be like seeing yourself. Because Jesus, in the resurrection, becomes the firstborn of all who believe and have died and yet will be raised again. He's the prototype of who you and I have been saved to become and to realize forever. So yeah, in the resurrection, we're going to be like Jesus is in his resurrection body. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's, yeah, get your brain around that. Uh, I don't think so. But that's why the Bible tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is what we go by, okay? And I know, you, maybe you're thinking, well, okay, when is that going to happen? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 20, or sorry, 21 through 23 tells us. In fact, check out 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Read through that chapter. It's, it's the great resurrection chapter in the Bible, okay? But anyway, these verses tell us, it says, for since by man came death, that would be, well, hey, look, look at you and I. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We've all done it. 
And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And it all began, well, the first guy that did that, fell into that trap, was the first man, Adam and Eve, right? So we're told here, it says, for since by man came death, by man also, remember Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, because he was born into this world as, you know, in the form of one of us. By man also came the resurrection of the dead, the change. Because it goes on to say, for as in Adam, Adam, as you recall, if you go back into Genesis, the body that God gave mankind was formed out of the dust of the earth. It was. It was an earthly body. It was a temporal body. And as it came from the earth, it would return to the earth at, at the time of, of physical death. So it says, for as in Adam all die, this is, and now comes the, the real true significance of the, of the meaning of the phrase being in Christ. It goes on to say, even so, in Christ, not in me, not in you, not in, we have nothing to bring this into reality in and of ourselves because of who we are in these earthly temporal bodies. That's why you have to look to Jesus as not only the beginning, but the end, the author, and the finisher of your faith. For as an Adam all die, we get that. Even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. But it tells us, but each in his own order. And that's the thing about God. In God's, everything that is of God, including his eternally predetermined redemptive plan of the ages, there's, there's an order to it. There's not chaos and confusion. There's not doubt or variables or thing, anything. It is all set up, established, scripted perfectly. There's an order. Bah, 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 bah. It says, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. And afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. That's right. At the second coming of Christ. And it's all going to kick off with the rapture that's promised in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, where we read, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who have died in Christ, meaning they suffered physical death, but they were in Christ. Though their souls have ascended to heaven to be with the Lord, there's going to be this wonderful moment when they will receive and suddenly be gloriously clothed in a resurrection body. That's what it means to be raised in the resurrection. And then it says, we who are alive and remain, that is, those of us in Christ who are alive in this world, in this life, at the time when that happens. Now, we don't know when it will happen because, well, we talked about that on our study in Palm Sunday dealing with the, um, the 70 weeks of Daniel's vision and that undetermined period of time we're in right now between the 69th and the 70th week leading up to the coming of Christ. But we don't know where we, you know, that could happen any time. That's what we're left with. As Jesus said that we are to watch and pray always that we may escape the, the 70th week, that time of great tribulation leading up to his second coming. But you see, all of the events in that time are, well, they're all part of the second coming of Christ. And so it says, you know, we in life will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And we'll get to escape all that, that final seven-year period where just, man, the apocalypse hits. And then Jesus comes back, and we will return with him for his, to establish his kingdom on the earth. See, the point being, okay, I, I'm getting into a whole lot of other stuff here, but we covered it already. 
the joy that Jesus, or the joy that was set before Jesus, has now been set before us in the person of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus. And remember what the Lord told Thomas, blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen. And this is where the faithful testimony of the many, the many who witnessed his resurrection as recorded in the word of God, including Paul the apostle, who testifies in 1 Corinthians 15, verses three through eight, becomes so essential, literally, this is where God sets it before us. Paul writes, he says, for, here we go, I delivered to you, here it is. I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that was Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, whom at the time that Paul wrote this letter, he says, of whom the greater part remain. They're still alive to the present, but some have fallen asleep. In other words, they've, 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 they've passed away. After that, Paul says, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, Paul declares, he says, he was seen by me also. These are eyewitnesses. It's, Paul refers to himself as one who was born out of due time. And so we have that testimony in the word of God. But if there's any doubt about that, especially as you go through the things in life that hit you, well, you know, God's got that covered too. As we saw with the disciples in that room when Jesus appeared, remember? Here we go. When he breathed on them, he said what? Receive the Holy Spirit. You see, when it comes to those who are born of the Spirit, children of God in Christ Jesus, the same Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, we're told in Romans chapter 6, lives in us. Regarding whom Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14 informs you of I, you and I, it says, in him you also trusted, that is, you trusted in Jesus, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and the, the big part about that is the resurrection that's set before us. It says, in whom also then having believed, now we got this course to run. And who knows? Only God knows what is on it between here and glory. So it goes on to say, you are sealed. God put the seal of, his, of, of your sonship, that you are his. You belong to him. You were sealed with, check it out, says the Holy Spirit of promise. This is God's telling you because his spirit lives inside you and me who are in Christ, that we belong. And it says, he is the guarantee of our inheritance. Inheritance isn't something that you have right now, but yet it's set before you. And it says, he's the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. God bought you through the blood of Jesus, and you belong to the Lord right now. And the seal of his spirit is in your heart. Not only is evidence of that fact, but a guarantee that in God's appointed time, redemption means he's going to redeem completely unto you. He's going he's to come, and you belong to him. And there's going to be this wonderful coming together of our soul into this new and eternally perfect heavenly resurrection body. And we will stand, the Bible says, to the praise of his glory and his grace forever. Yeah, the same spirit, I said, who raised Christ from the dead in a new, eternally glorious, perfect, incorruptible heavenly body 
The promise of that for you and I lives in us right now as believers, as God's guarantee, living evidence of the joy that has now been set before us. And I can remember when I got, when I turned over my life to Jesus Christ and gave up everything for that and for the promise of the life that God had for me in Christ. I remember when the Spirit came into my life. There was joy. And the joy of that which God has set before me through the resurrection, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ has now become the joy for which I, and you as well, can now endure the trials and tribulations that we face in the course of our daily lives as we run our course through this present life in this present world in these frail, weak, temporal human bodies. So I want to close today with 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. You mark this one, man, and check it out. Read it again and again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us, brought us forth. This is being born in the Spirit. Brought us forth again unto a living hope. This is a hope that doesn't die. This is a hope that cannot be erased, wiped away, or extinguished by the trials and tribulations of this present life. Who has begotten us, brought us forth into a living hope through, it says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, listen to this, reserved right now, reserved you got a reservation reserved in heaven for you who are kept right now by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and the word of his truth. Through faith, because you've got to go with this, man. You gotta, this is our reality. This is our promise. This is our hope. This is our salvation. This is the plan. This is what... Being in Christ is all about. Who are kept by the power of God, it says, through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed, ta-da, in the last time. So what does that mean for right now? It says, in this, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith is being tested. It's being proven. We think, well, if I'm a Christian, I mean, some people think, well, if I'm a Christian, everything is going to be a cakewalk from here on out. That's absolutely baloney. It, the opposite is true. The things of this life are the things that prove the faith that we embrace. The trials, the tribulations, the things we go for. I mean, have to go through because the joy has been set before us. You got it? You want it? Go for it, man. It's more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. This faith that we have now in that which has been set before us may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation Jesus Christ, when we see him face to face. You know, I've always believed that the, that the thing every Christian, having crossed the finish line of death, passed through death into that and received that glorious, incorruptible, eternally perfect heavenly body. As we stand before Jesus to the praise of the glory of his grace, in the, that eternal perfection of our resurrection bodies, I've always believed that every Christian is going to say something like, wow, Jesus, you got me here. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to say that. Question is, in the course of this present life, 
Will you allow him to accomplish that in you? Will you surrender your life and everything to Jesus? God set it before you now. Do you really want it? What value do you place on that? So that you would surrender your life and everything to Jesus. All for the joy of the glory that will to one day be revealed in us. You see, it's being totally focused on following and, and learning from Jesus. So as to realize the same joy that he lived to realize and did realize. It's what being a Christian, being born again, is all about. So, there you have it. Do you want it? Like I said, go for it, man. He can totally make this happen if you let him.